I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about Gulp, the JavaScript task runner, kinetic scrolling, page visibility, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have a blog post which is an introduction to Gulp. Now, Gulp is a task management system for JavaScript, kind of like Yeoman or Grunt. Uh, pretty much more like Grunt than anything else. However, uh, Gulp takes a bit of a different approach to defining your different tasks in JavaScript. Now, let's go ahead and check that out and see how it works. Now, the blog post introduction is a little bit, you know, showy. It's a step aside grunt. There's a new task runner in town. Whoa. Whoa, them's fighting words. If task runners could fight. Uh, anyway, so here's a, here's a little syntax comparison between what you would use to initialize a grunt script that expanded and implemented SAS and auto prefixing. And then here is the same script using gulp. It uses piping to implement different parts of source control and functions that you might pipe through different tasks that you have for your different JavaScript projects. Now, as you might expect, it supports almost all of the same plugins that Grunt does at the moment. There's uh, libraries for SAS, CoffeeScript, uh, a whole bunch of things, JavaScript linting, compression, minification, all that. So super easy to install it. We can see all the uh, Gulp plugins that we have right here. Uh, it's very, very easy to install. You just install them using NPM and then loading, easy as well. Now, we're not, going to not, uh, we're not going to walk through everything here on the show, but I do recommend checking it out if you're getting just a little bit frustrated with your grunt tasks. Very cool stuff. And if you are afraid of task runners, there's actually an excellent blog post over on the 24 Ways blog uh, that I believe Chris Coyer wrote up recently. It was yeah. all about task runners for people that feel like things like task runners are scary and why you should be using one. Did we cover that on the show? We sure did. We did cover that on the show. Our therapist said you never listen, and now that uh, I see that that's true. Next up is this really cool project called Kinetic. It's basically kinetic scrolling in JavaScript. Does so, that mean that this can read my mind? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, kinetic scrolling is basically when <laughs> you scroll up and down like on a mobile device, like uh, an iPhone, for example, and you get kind of the the rubber banding effect or... Or it speeds up as you scroll more. Or, or, right, you have momentum scrolling depending on, you know, how fast you flick up or down. Or it knows exactly where on the page you want to go to and it, it reads your thoughts to get there. Exactly. Uh, so this is exactly what that project, or what this project does. We have a couple of different demos here. So let's just look at those demos first. There's a basic drag and scroll. So you can just click and drag and it scrolls up and down. Here is the same concept, but with momentum scrolling. So you see I'm clicking and I'm dragging, and then when I let go, there's momentum. So just like on an iPhone, pretty cool. They have a couple of other demos here. Here, they've done the same thing, but with cover flow. So look at that. Wow. Whoa, pretty cool UI concept you might be familiar with if you have an iPhone or if you've used iTunes. I was actually curious as to how they were doing this, and they're doing it with CSS3 transforms. So when you drag along here, it's actually transforming each one of these covers. And if you'll notice down at the bottom, they actually have this reflection going on. So if we pop into the Chrome Dev Tools and hover over one of those, you can see they're doing that with the WebKit box reflect property here which is, of course, only supported in WebKit-based browsers, so be careful if you use that. Still, nonetheless, pretty cool. So, let's go back. We've seen all these demos here, or at least a couple of them. Next to that, they have an explanation for each one of these. If you click on the explanation, whoa, it's an entire blog post. TLDR. Just for that one demo, and there's actually a blog post for each one of these. So if you want to see how that cover flow is built, you can click on explanation and there's an entire blog post detailing that. And this person is uh, pretty smart. They said that they actually implemented cover flow 
in C and C++ six years ago. Uh, but now you can just do it with CSS animation because, of course, that's GPU accelerated. So it will animate very smoothly even on uh, some lower end phones. Uh, but here you can see exactly how they're doing those transformations using translate X and Z, and then they're rotating it slightly along the Y axis. Lots more to dig into here. We're not going to dig into all of it on the show, but pretty cool stuff. That is pretty cool. Next up, we have a project called ifvisible.js. This is a very small JavaScript utility that does one thing, which is checks to see if the current web page is visible. Now, this is going to check if the current tab is visible or current window. The nice thing about it is it is cross-browser, so it will work even on browsers that don't support the HTML5 property to check if the current page is visible or active. Now, um, not really too much to say about it, but just say, hey, if this is visible, well, okay, display, uh, display a pop-up, or actually probably don't display a pop-up. Uh, or if somebody switches tab or minimizes the browser, then boom, you can go ahead and execute some code when that happens. Now, uh, this is important because you might have a page that has heavy animations, and when somebody switches tabs, you don't necessarily want to be running those. This can save battery power on devices such as laptops when they're not plugged into the wall. Uh, it can even reduce server strain. Let's say you have a function that periodically calls back to your server. Well, you don't need to be doing that if the person isn't checking the page. Just go ahead and run that, uh, pause it when the person navigates away, and then return when they come back and reactivate the page. Now, this plugin is available on GitHub. We'll have a link to it in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash gotreehouse, or search for us in iTunes at The Treehouse Show. Also, please rate us. If you, you know, if you check us out in iTunes, we like that. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is this jQuery plugin called Jack in the Box. And before you go any further, I should point out that it also has animate.css as a dependency, so be aware of that. However, it is pretty cool. Basically, it will allow you to trigger animate.css animations as you scroll down a page. So here I have a little example. And if I scroll down, whoa, look at that. You what? can see that things slide into the page as I'm scrolling down. The creator of this plugin points out a couple of advantages. So, for example, this is smaller than other JavaScript parallax plugins like Scrollorama. So, if that's important to you, if you want to try to reduce the page load time of uh, your website a little bit, that might be a place to look. Maybe Jack in the Box is really all you need. Although, keep in mind that you do need to include animate.css as well, so that does add a little bit to the weight of the page. Um, and it also executes pretty quickly. It has fairly lightweight code. Um, but uh, the usage is pretty simple. You just go ahead and call Jack in the Box on the body of the document or whatever part of the document that you actually want to trigger the animations on. That's probably the body though, so I would recommend going with their suggested usage here. And then they have a couple of other additional jQuery options that you can trigger here. So, for example, you could say, you know, what the box class or animate class is or what the offset is. Uh, pretty cool stuff. and uh, It doesn't quite work on mobile devices just yet, so that's another thing to be aware of. But the author says if you have a solution to that, you are more than welcome to suggest it via GitHub. So, pretty cool stuff. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a blog post by Todd Motto on avoiding anonymous JavaScript functions. Why in the world would you want to avoid anonymous JavaScript functions? Well, he goes through why in this blog post. It's actually really thorough, and uh, this is one of my favorite types of refactoring blog posts, where he shows a bit of code that works, which we have right here. Uh, now, you'll notice right here, after adding the click function, to this event listener, we've got this anonymous function that takes the event as an argument, then does some stuff and adds the active class if the class is not contained on that particular particular element, uh, then prevents the rest of the event chain from bubbling up. Now, uh, he lists some ideas on why you should stop doing this with anonymous functions. Well, they can be more difficult to debug. Uh, they can't be tested as easily, can't be reused, and blah, blah, blah. So, okay, what do you do then? 
Well, uh, you would create a function called toggle menu that does the exact same thing, and then add that to the event listener for click, and just call it there. Now, doesn't that look better? Yes, it does. So that way, if we introduce another element, we can just add the same function there without causing too much grief, as he says. Now, um, that's good, but as he says in here, we can do better. So he can, we can add the query selector to a variable, um, then trigger it that way, uh, and then go through, and he goes through and does a couple more refactorings to click events, change events, and then he even goes through and shows you how to bind it in case you are interested in passing parameters. Anyway, this is a really thorough blog post that I recommend checking out. It's one of those more in-depth ones that focuses on good coding style and why you want to do something. So I, I really enjoyed this. Good work, Todd. Very nice. Well, next up is this really nice resource called What's the Closest Google Font? So you're... Geographically? Uh, not exactly. So let's say you're mocking up something. Maybe you're using a, a tool like OmniGraffle or Balsamic Mockups or Photoshop or whatever you like to use. And you're using this font, and then you realize, oh, wait, I actually need to license that font, and it's really oh, expensive wow, to do yeah. that. Oh, Whoops. Oh, man. <laughs> what am I going to do? Time. Project's over. Well, fortunately, Google Fonts are properly licensed, and you can find the closest match to those very popular fonts using this tool. So they have sans serif and serif fonts listed out here, and these are some fairly popular fonts, so Myriad Pro or Rockwell. I love using Rockwell for a lot of stuff. They suggest using uh, a font that is very similar. So, you can, so they say, here's Rockwell, here's what it looks like. Here's Cameron, which looks very similar to Rockwell. You probably won't ever notice the difference, uh, maybe except for a couple little uh, bits here and there, but it's pretty much the same. Now, I thought this was a banner ad over on the right side, but it's really just related to this, this post. It says, spend 93% less time, stop searching for web fonts. So uh, there you go. There's a testimonial. You'll spend 93% less time searching for web fonts if you use this tool. Um, they have other popular fonts like Century Gothic, uh, Gil Sans, et cetera. So pretty cool stuff. Not a whole lot to say about it, but uh, I've had that happen before where I'm using a licensed font, and I actually didn't realize it was licensed maybe through the operating system or through the app that I was using, and you actually need a separate license to use it on your website. Fortunately, Google Fonts takes care of all that for you, and it's totally cool to use those. So pretty cool stuff. It's yeah, a great way to find a close match. We've, we've all been there, buddy. It's nothing, nothing to worry about. Next up, we have a blog post called Yo Polymer, a Whirlwind tour of web component tooling. Whirlwind? Yeah, a world, world, whirlwind. World, world whirlwind. Okay. This is a talk given by Adi Asmani at uh, .js on how he uses Yoman and Polymer to create this whole crazy, amazing jukebox application. So he goes through the four different specs about composing web components, which include custom elements, templates, the shadow DOM, and HTML imports. And this uses the Polymer project, which we've gone over on a previous episode of the Treehouse Show. Now, what are web components? Well, you could go through and read this huge W3C specification, or watch this talk and get a nice little introduction by Adi Asmani. Now, this is 22 minutes, definitely worth it. As a bonus, Throughout this talk, he builds this jukebox application with Polymer. Let's see, here is a screenshot of what the app looks like. Now, this is all built using web components. Now, each of the different web components has a benefit on why you want to use it, including templates and the Shadow DOM and all that. Now, um, this uses Polymer.js, which we talked about before, which gives you polyfills for all of the different web components because they're not actually available yet today. but using certain JavaScript polyfills included in Polymer.js, you can actually get started using them right now. This is definitely something that you want to check out, really take the time to watch the videos, and even read the source code that is available, because this is going to be the future of the web. We're seeing this now, but in the next few years, we're really going to have to start learning as developers how to use these things. So absolutely fascinating post by Adi Osmani. Very cool stuff. <clears throat> well, next up, 
is something much simpler, actually not too much simpler, uh, but a little bit. Bulletproof accessible icon fonts. This is a blog post from the Filament Group. If you haven't heard of the Filament Group, they're, uh, they're pretty legit. They, they post some really important seminal blog posts, so it's important to listen to them when they post something. Uh, in this post, they open up with a disclaimer where they say, well, you know, we actually prefer and recommend to use SVGs for vector icons, and that's a link to another blog post where they talk about that. Uh, however, they collaborate with a lot of clients where they might uh, already be using icon fonts, so they have to go ahead and go with that. They don't want to just, you know, re-implement all of the, the icons just because they prefer to use SVGs. So, if you must use icon fonts, here is a really great way to do it. First, they start off by talking about accessibility. So, for example, if you're using icon fonts, oftentimes you'll run into this issue where a screen reader uh, might look at this star and it says, black star favorite. That's not very useful to someone that's using a screen reader. So, instead, they suggest using the ARIA hidden attribute and setting it to true so that it will go ahead and hide uh, whatever that particular uh, icon might be. And instead, you can have something that's a little bit uh, more appropriate there. They also talk about how to use fallbacks uh, where, you know, you could go ahead and use the undefined uh, space in Unicode, uh, which is often used by uh, by emojis, so that's one possibility there. Um, but if you're trying to avoid the dreaded rectangle glyph, they offer up a couple of other ways uh, to go ahead and do that. They basically break it out by saying, you know, you have decorative icons um, where the A grade experience looks like this. It has, you know, the proper icon. And for C grade browsers, which might not be that great, you can just go ahead and replace it with text if it's just decorative. If it is a critical icon, however, which is different from decorative icon, a critical icon might be something where, you know, you have to display the icon. There's something about it that's just essential. And maybe this isn't the best example of the Twitter icon, but there, you know, another icon might be essential to using an app. Here's what you would have it look like in an A-grade browser, and again, you could go ahead and replace that with text, and they give a slightly different technique uh, for doing that. They also offer an image-based fallback. So, again, if you need to have that, uh, that font, or rather that glyph displayed, no matter what, you can go ahead and use an image-based fallback, which they offer the technique for right here. Pretty cool stuff. It's a really, uh, really involved post. But uh, that's what Filament Group is so great at. They write these really comprehensive posts that tell you exactly the best, most right way that you can do something. It's, um, it's really fascinating. So definitely be sure to check out that post. Yeah. That's pretty much all we have time for this week. I'm at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. Also, search for us on iTunes at The Treehouse Show, and don't forget to rate us and subscribe. And, of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.